Okay, music is done, right? Com meu visa eu passo mais. Yeah, eu posso pegar um táxi later. sem pôr a mão na cadeira para pagar. Eu posso comprar online e sair do mundo inteiro. Eu posso ver meu time jogar sem perder tempo na fila. Eu posso pegar online de um jeito fácil e rápido. Eu posso pagar em todos os lugares que eu vou. Com o meu Visa, eu posso tudo isso. E com o seu cartão, você pode? Visa, o cartão número um do mundo. Ok, mais uma vez, galera, com vocês, Daniel Matros. Hello, hello. Let's do this again. How are you guys today? Are you feeling good? All good, all good. So, for me to know, how many people here speak English? That's like everyone. Good stuff. Because I speak very bad Portuguese. I know mano, breja, and obrigado. That's all I know. Which is important, especially in Brazil, especially living in Dubai now, where um, we don't really have too much alcohol. And if we drink too much alcohol, we go to jail. That's not a good thing. So uh, technically, we, don't go, we gotta do a bunch of stuff before we go to jail, but still, you know, it's uh, not a very good thing to do. So I am Daniel. Uh, I'm from, born and raised in Sweden. Uh, lived in Germany, studied there. Moved back to Sweden. Um, I studied teaching, actually. So I'm a teacher, a history, geography, social science teacher. Like, that's what I studied. And then when I was 21, I realized I don't like kids. And uh, that's, that's pretty tough for a teacher to realize, like, I really don't like kids at all. Age doesn't matter, kids. Um, I think they're a man's biggest opponent, so that's why. Um, and then I just uh, worked in marketing for a while. When I was 20, how old was I? I think I was 21, 20 years old. Uh, applied to DICE uh, in Stockholm to work as a global community manager. At that time, it was Battlefield by Company 2. So that was that time before Battlefield got huge. And um, I had my first interview. I was really nervous. Uh, calling me for a second interview. Exciting times. I got the job, and then I just started my path. That's how I got into gaming in a professional way. I always used to play games before. So um, my dad bought a Nintendo 8-bit for me when I was five or six. I'm not that old, by the way. I'm 29. So. So when I was 20, uh, no, when I was uh, five years old, and then just kept playing PC games, Battle Chess, Captain Comic, Wolfenstein 3D, all these different games. And um, I think if you do something long enough, if you interact with something long enough, you become really good at it. I was terrible at CS and that kind of stuff, right? But I was good at games. I was good at understanding what make games good. So how many people here make games right now? It's a good amount of people. All of you play games, I, I expect, right? whether it's casual games, whether it's PC games, whether it's console games, right? And all of you probably have a subjective idea of what makes a game good, right? I mean, some people say content, some people say narrative, some people say graphics. Um, but before I start talking, I want to ask a question, by the way. Here's question time. Um, what makes a game good for you? Because that's what I'm going to talk about. What makes a game good from a dev perspective? So, does anyone want to answer this question? What makes a game good for you? Why do you think a game should be good? Is it because there's a good storyline? Is it because the mechanics are good? Is it because the sound is good? You can't say everything. You have to say one of these things, by the way. Anyone? So, everyone plays games, but no one knows what makes a game good. Awesome. <laughs> okay, so from my perspective, what makes a game good is the gameplay. It's how you design a game. Um, systems are important. Mechanics are very important. Um, sound is very important. Uh, yeah, ambient is important. But what makes a game good is the design itself. 
And I'm going to take you guys through what goes into the core design of what we make when we concept games, when we prototype games like Battlefront, like FIFA, like Battlefield, how we think in this process and how we kind of carry this forward. So the first question is, for you people who here are making games, people who have been thinking about making games, people who don't like making games or would like to do them anyway, any kind of people that like games, how do I sell a game? Right? That's, I think that's the most important question to ask. Like, how, how the hell do I get people to play this shit? I mean, how are they going to do it? So does anyone have, a, have an answer to this? How do you get people to play your games? No? You all play games, but you have no idea how you get to play them. You know? Time. Hype. OK. Hi yeah, hype is good. Hype is good. Um, so basically, what we t talk about how we get people to play our games is um, early on in prototype, even before product, in concept phase, when we're in phase one, gate one as we call it, we look at what kind of game we want to make. We look at the demographic. Who plays our games? Uh, what kind of traits do these people have? What do they do in their free time? Uh, what games have they played before? Are they interested in uh, war games? Do they play Counter-Strike? Do they play Call of Duty? Looking at Battlefield now, by the way. Um, we look at all these different demographics or behavioral patterns and see what you people do. Yes, we do track it because we have telemetry, we have analytics, we have all this stuff to kind of tell us what kind of games you play, what you would want to play. <coughs> and um, when we track that, we look at your traits as well. So we basically look at what other games do well and we try to adapt that to what we do but in our own special way. So I'm talking here is, let's say on a very fundamental level, let's say this is an indie game. So you have a set budget, you have a set art direction, you have a set mechanic as how you want the game to perform. Um, you have set sound, let's say you're alpha ready. 20% of your game budget should go towards marketing. Hype, as you said. And you can do that organically or whatever. I'm not going to get into marketing because I'm really bad at marketing. Like really bad. I know the context of it, but I'm not very good at it. But 20% of your game should go into marketing. That leaves 30% for game design. And that is core game design. You still have to put all the game design into the mechanical fields. But 30% of your game should be strictly game design. It should be strictly persistent system, narrative, um, social fabric all these kinds of important things. Um, it still applies today. Now I'm going to take you through different ways of these four core pillars that we call it in game design. Um, how these are important and kind of how some games use them and how some games use them less. Um, let's ask a question again. Let's see if you guys are awake now. So Angry Birds and Clash of Clans, uh, mobile games in general, does it have a story? So do this if it's no, do this if it's yes. Let's see, does it have a story? Not really, does it? It doesn't really have a story. But it has a narrative. A narrative is usually when you have plus and minus. Um, so less technical it will be, you have an objective you have to overcome. There's a challenge. Um, the challenge could be to save the world. The challenge could be to um, hit bad pigs, the challenge could be to build, train, raid, as you have the core loop in, in Clash of Clans. So that's the whole narrative. <coughs> and how you build the narrative is basically based on, based on your writers, on your team. Uh, not necessarily writers as in like lyrical writers, but you have writers that write the story. They write the backstory for your characters. They write the backstory for your story. So you don't have content holds. Um, Battlefield 3 single player. Has anyone played it? Did you like it? Honestly, though. No. You did? OK, because I hated it. I thought it was terrible. But let me tell you why. Because uh, I worked on that game as well. But let me tell you why. There were so many holes in the storyline because we didn't do our research. We didn't put enough writers on the team. And we mixed the game design too much with the game design for multiplayer. So basically, I'm talking very abstract now. Trust me, it'll get clearer the, the more I go into the, the subject. So. When we talk about narrative in this case, like Battlefield 3 single player, what we did wrong is we didn't have enough writers. We didn't include the conceptual game design into single player. All the actions you could do in multiplayer were not there in single player. So when a player is playing the game in SP, it doesn't expect the same action as in MP. So that's kind of a faulty loop. That's something that needs to be closed down. We have, <coughs> sorry, I've been sick for a week. And the weather doesn't help because it's really goddamn hot in Sao Paulo. That's why. Um, 
where was I? Skyrim, for instance. Great game. Who likes Skyrim? I hated it when I first started playing it. It was terrible. It's, the progression system was terrible. I'll get to that later as well. The progression system was terrible. The, um, the story was good, though. So what made Skyrim so good in the eyes of everyone? Although it was buggy as hell, it barely worked when you bought it on launch day, uh, like all other games, like Battlefield, for instance. Um, and what made Skyrim so good was because the narrative was so solid. You had an objective. You know who you were, or you, would about to, you were, was about to find out who you were. You had a goal. You had an ambition. And you had ways of getting there. Your ways of getting there is side questing, is interacting with other characters. That's a narrative. Uh, and that's a narrative that goes into every game. Uh, there are different core pillars for the narrative as well. If you want to break it down, we've got the setting. This might come very, very clear to everyone, but we'll go further, we'll venture further in and I'll explain more of this. So setting basically have time and place, whether it's fantasy, whether it's a uh, soccer pitch, whether it's uh, World War V or whatever it might be. Um, your characters, that's where your backstory comes in. That's where you have to do a lot of writing. You have to do a lot of design. You have to do a lot of research. Who is this character? Why should these people, all these beautiful people here in Sao Paulo, why should they play this character? We we're working on Faith and Mirror's Edge. You guys know Mirror's Edge, right? <coughs> so we we're working on Mirror's Edge at DICE, and we had this um, opportunity to turn Faith into this super sexual character, huge boobs, big ass, looks like a Brazilian model, basically. We had that opportunity to do so, but we chose to do the exact opposite uh, because we feel, or we felt back then in the studio that we don't think that it sends out the right signal. We don't think a lot of people would feel comfortable with seeing this. You've got Tomb Raider already, man. That's enough, right? So we, so we chose Faith to basically put her in a setting that was uh, very sterile. So there are like four colors in Mirror's Edge, basically, that are dominant. Uh, that's the art direction. Um, you have Shimmer, you have Chrome. She's supposed to save the world, basically, or save her city and save her group of friends as a runner. Um, so her character was a very amicable character, was a likable character. It was someone that we wanted everyone to relate with, and that carries into the story with how the conceptual design works. The plot is basically, <coughs> sorry, the plot is basically they're in this uh, hereditary uh, kind of dictatorship. Uh, she has to fight her way through, and that's co that goes common in storylines. I mean, you have protagonist, antagonist. Um, the climax is basically when all the all the events are happening and unfolding. Basically, the ending of Mirror's Edge. I'm not going to spoil it for you now. Definitely not going to spoil a new one for you as well. Uh, and the conclusion is basically what happens in the end. How does this follow? Usually, games like GTA lets you play until the end. Um, and then more after, so you can level, you can do side quests and whatnot. But a lot of games stop, like The Last of Us, which was more of a, You guys have played The Last of Us, right? One of the best games I've ever played in my life. It's really, really good. And that is a heavy narrative-driven game. Uh, so, so basically, it adheres to all of this. Now, Angry Birds, Clash of Clans, and mobile games, this doesn't mean shit to these people. They don't care about this. But they care about the social fabric and achievement perspective of it that I'll get to later. But Heavy Rain, Last of Us, Skyrim, <coughs> those games are very narrative-driven. And when you work on, on, on a game, basically, you can't do everything. I mean. It would be wonderful if we could do everything. That would be the best game in the world. But sadly, that reality does not happen that way. You know? Reality is more complex than that. Um, because time, resources, money. It's fun to make games, but it's fun to make money too, so you can make games. Um, so you have to focus on one or two aspects of this. And starting out as an indie developer, I would very much advise you to stick to one of these four core pillars I'm going to talk about later as well. Uh, whether it's just narrative, it is strictly social fabric, whether it's strictly achievements. Talking about social fabric, you guys are going to say, <coughs> Daniel, you're talking so much bullshit right now. Which is true, because these games, these mobile games, they don't adhere to all these principles we're talking about right now until we come back later down the road. So basically, what mobile games do, they're very, very clever. The core loop of a mobile game, which I guess you guys have been working on too, right? You don't work on PC games, it's mobile. or Anyone here work on mobile games? A few, yeah, great. That's awesome. Oh, really? I mean, it's really awesome. <laughs> so the core loop of a mobile game is three steps. Very simple. Clash of Clans. You build, you train, you raid. Angry Birds. I haven't played too much, but you have a bird, you shoot at some pig, and then you win the level, you progress in the level. You have uh, Angry Birds Arena, for instance, and whatnot. And uh, those games are very tailored on social fabric and achievements. So basically, there is no story behind it. 
the design is not based on your choices. The design is based on a limited amount of choices you can do. In Angry Birds, you can't customize the bird, for instance, so you don't have to put a bunch of design perspective in there. In your design document in Angry Birds, you have more mechanics, you have more animation, and you have social fabric, and also how you're going to get money back from people in an e-commerce kind of level. But looking at, <coughs> sorry, but looking at the narrative, basically, these games adhere to a completely different level. I'll talk about that later as well. We're going to the social fabric now, offline versus online. And um, so you guys have played Candy Crush and stuff, right? So hands up whoever has played mobile games like Candy Crush, Clash of Clans, whatnot. Candy Crush from Sweden, by the way. Just so you know. Um, no, so games like this are basically built to pull you in and never let you go. Uh, what I'm talking about here, it doesn't do it with a narrative. It doesn't do it with a wonderful storyline. You're not some sort of hero in Kind of Crush. You're a person with too much time and an iPad, basically, or with an interest in playing the game. Um, so what it focuses on is your social fabric. You share with your friends, you get in-game currency, you spend that in-game currency in the game to progress towards the level you want to be in. <coughs> records can be broken, records can be held, but ultimately, ultimately what, the, what mobile games come down to is to have you spend money, <coughs> sorry, via your own system or via the game system. Either you pay for it or you earn the points via inviting friends. That's the social fabric in mobile games, for instance. Um, we talk about multiplayer. Multiplayer these past 15 years in PC, console, hasn't changed at all. Mechanic of it hasn't changed at all. Sure, you might have integrated VoIP, you might have um, API handshakes with Facebook, with Twitter and whatnot. You have streaming capabilities now, but that's not the core of a multiplayer. A core of a multiplayer is me connecting to a server, whether it's uh, dedicated or peer-to-peer. -peer. I can play a game versus someone online. That's a multiplayer. And then you can have voice solutions on it. You can have leaderboards. You can have stats and whatnot. But multiplayer has really not progressed at all, um, which makes things interesting. So why do people play online games? Why do you guys play online games? Go ahead. Can you, get, can you get the mic too? <laughs> right over there. Okay. Can we get the mic turned on? Test. I think it's because it's social. You yeah. can talk with other people. Right, right. Do you play single player games? Yeah, I, I prefer single player games. Okay. But you, you play single player in a social way, right? Uh, that depends. Do you play GTA, Skyrim, that kind of stuff? Yes, but n n not much. I, I like to focus on my single player time. Okay. So basically, the, um, the development of AI, we spent a lot of money making AI for Battlefield 3, and you saw how that turned out. So we improved it for Battlefield 4, and the AI in Battlefield 4 is way more solid. Let's say AI in Far Cry. Everyone knows what AI is, right? Artificial intelligence, the way it simulates human behavior in a game. Um, <coughs> more and more studios are spending a lot of money on this uh, because they know this is going to be the future. Not everyone wants to play online, but if you want a good single player experience, you have to pay AI. AI money, AI research and whatnot. Good writers for AI as well. Um, so social fabric and offline games like Skyrim, like uh, <coughs> sorry, Far Cry Prime or, or uh, Far, Cry 4, Far Cry 4 Amazing Game, it comes in the, in the factor of NPCs. You have to script your missions. You have to design your missions in that way so it feels like you're a part of something. You're part of something bigger in the world. Um, in multiplayer, people take care of that for you. You go into multiplayer with an ambition to be, I'm going to be the best, or I'm going to make friends. I'm going to raid with friends in World of Warcraft. Um, or I'm going to beat this guy in StarCraft II or Hearthstone or whatnot. But in single player, you have no one to beat but the computer, so you have to make sure the AI is on par. You have to make sure you belong in the society. So AI is going to get a lot, lot bigger um, coming down the road, especially integrated with VR. And uh, <coughs> since VR experiences on console, you, everyone knows what VR is, right? Virtual reality. OK. So it's pretty shit right now. Looks cool, but it's pretty shit because you can't do much. It's like having a headset inside a game. But what's going to be cool further down the line is when AI starts integrating more with VR. Uh, then you're going to have exciting experiences. They're experimenting with this at Sony right now, where um, basically the way you turn your head is how the character is going to react to you, which is really, really cool stuff. We tried some of that for Mirror's Edge, um, but then 
we'll see how that goes further down the road. But it's, it's going to be really cool, really cool stuff. Uh, accomplishments. This is not just Xbox accomplishments. You get an achievement, 50 gamer points. I don't play Xbox, I play PlayStation, by the way. Uh, you don't get 50 gamer score, 50 gamer points or whatnot. This is not about it. That's, that's also an achievement, yes. But it has to be built in based on platform. So um, let's get those easy achievements out of the way. You have to build in achievements. It's a persistence level, basically. So you build... Um, Score 200 games in multiplayer. That's a contextual one. You have to do that for Xbox, basically. What I'm talking about here is a persistent system. So when you level, you gain something because you level. Um, there are very, very few games, if not any, I think, out there that just lets you grind without a reward. Um, a persistent system is probably the most important thing you can build into a game. Uh, mobile games, PC games, everyone has that in common where you build your character based on how much you grind. Um, so you guys have probably played World of Warcraft or other types of games, role-playing games, especially where you're rewarded with items, you're rewarded with uh, more skills, more traits. This comes as very common. Everyone knows about this, but designing them is extremely difficult because they need to be balanced towards your end objective, basically. So um, we had one situation at DICE in 2010 with Bad Company 2 where... Um, you had 50 levels of progression. You could rank up to 50 levels. And we saw that after level 20, people just stopped playing. Not everyone, obviously, but a lot of people just stopped playing. So we looked at the analytics, and we looked at the game, and we realized that after level 20, there's no progression system. You can't win anything. You get some sort of badge saying you're some general number five, something like that. But you didn't have a system that kind of gave you new things. It wasn't exciting anymore. And I think in a world where persistent systems are the most important things you can work on, you know, you, um, that's definitely one of the main budget aspects of your indie development stage or any kind of video game being done today. Then, of course, you have games like Heavy Rain or Last of Us, which don't focus on this. That's fine. They're straight, straightly uh, story-driven. So it's, uh, it's also cool. Um, regarding accomplishments, we all want to complete games. Right? I mean, how many people feel shit about not completing a game entirely? I do, but I'm okay with it. Dragon Age 2? No, Dragon Age 2 and 3, I didn't even complete. Mostly because I was bored. <laughs> it wasn't that much fun. Um, but we, we all want to complete games. We all want to do a completion of the games. And this is what we focus on, what we, what we prototype, what we concept. We think about when do people complete a game? How many hours in? So when people say it's got nine hours of single player, that's because it has nine hours of progression systems, not straight single player, it's content basically. Your frames, your slides, or whatever you want to call it. Um, and nine hours of persistence system. And if you have nine hours of persistence today, it's very, very deep. But if you're an indie developer, and if you're working on any game right now that you feel has to have a persistence system, don't make it complicated. Make it really easy. We made the mistake in Battlefield 3 to make it extremely complicated. Because in Bad Company 2, you only had to level 20. Level 50 had nothing. So in Battlefield 3, you could, up to level, you could go up to level 50. You had millions of items. Items raining over you all the time. Medals, ribbons, camos, attachments, scopes, rocket launchers, everything in Battlefield uh, 3. And we made it too complicated. Because we realized when we look at our telemetry, when we looked at our analytics, that not everyone used the items that we had spent four or five months building. So that's four or five months right in the drain. So no one gives a shit anymore. No one's going to play it. So what we need to do is basically you can always sell it later as an X-Pack. You cannot spend all your time building all these items no one's going to play with, but you build a solid progression system instead, which matters to your character. And that comes from listening to the community. That comes from looking at telemetry, looking at the data, looking at what people use in your game overall. I mean, we had, um, we had a patch in Battlefield 3, Battlefield 4, um, there was a game called HK416, like a rifle, assault rifle, for the assault combat medic class. And um, after a patch, 85-86% of people playing Battlefield 4, one month after launch, used that weapon. It kind of shows it's unbalanced and the persistence system sucks. So we had to rebalance that again. Again, I mean, this is the heart of your game. This is what's going to take people forward. They want to feel like they're earning something. Um, and we all want to earn something when we play games. We don't want to grind and have nothing, whether it's a good experience or something to brag with or an online status that's really, really cool. Uh, 
There's an epic meaning to this too. This is a question that always comes up when you scope, when you uh, prototype, when you concept. This is the most, like everyone asks this question. Not everyone knows what it means, but everyone asks this question. Everyone wants an answer. So let's say we were pitching Battlefield 4 and we're all in the concept room together with our VPs and directors, creative directors. And a creative director asks, well, who am I after I played this game? What do I do after I played this? I mean, who am I? What is this game going to give me? And I'm like, that's the stupidest fucking question I've ever heard in my life. So how do I answer that? You're, you're you, just a better you because you played multiplayer. <laughs> that didn't work at all. So he wants to know who you are. So this is also very important. I mean, this is more important, I guess, if you prototype, if you're in concept phase and whatnot. But still, who are you after you completed the game? You want to be a person that's, uh, to us, I mean, that's, I'm talking from a brand perspective now. To us, we want to be a person that's, we want you to be a person that's synonymous with our brand, basically. We want you to feel like the game you're playing has a special feel. You're expert in what you do. In Battlefield, we used to call it easy to learn, hard to master. Uh, basically saying everyone can play, but not everyone can be really, really good at it. Um, so that's who we want you to be. And I guess other games as well, they want you to be an explorer. They want you to be an adventurer. They want you to be a sports star. This is in all the pitches you will ever see. If you uh, Google game pitches, FIFA or baseball or, or um, Uncharted, for instance. Uncharted have a good pitch out. I saw it on SlideShare the other day. Who do, you, who do you want to be after you play this game? You want to be an adventurer. And this goes back to who we're targeting the game for. So if you like sports, I would never, I would, if you don't like sports, I would never tell you, hey man, play some FIFA, it's amazing. Because you probably don't give a shit. You probably don't care. Um, but that's who we want you to be after you played it so we can sell the next copy, right? So we can market the next copy to you. So you can refer your friends to it and so forth. And who am I also goes in hand with good quality games, um, good persistent systems, like I said, a solid game, no problems, no bugs. That's difficult though, but still. So that's the epic meaning of who am I. And remember that. I swear, this, this sounds really crazy. You're all probably going to think, Daniel talks a whole bunch of shit on stage. But trust me, this is the most important question you're ever going to have when you make a game. And it's not just important because it's philosophical. It's important because it goes into practice in whatever you do when you design a game. Um, so always keep it in mind. Who are you making this game for? Right? That's a, that's a, I think that's the most important thing to imagine. So think about that later. When you play a game, who am I after I play this game? What do I do after I play this game? Important stuff. You also have something that's called a core loop. How many of you guys know what a core loop is? So basically, like I, like I said before, a core loop is mostly focused on mobile, though. Uh, but core loop is Clash of Clans. You build, you train, you raid. These three things over and over and over again. So what you do when you build a game, you build the mechanics, you build the foundation first. Um, so if, you do <coughs> if you're doing a Clash of Clans style of game, work on that first. Don't mix in all these persistent systems, designs, whatnot. Don't do that. Don't do that to start with. Make your core loop solid. Make sure people understand what they're doing. Make sure people know as soon as they come in, OK, this is what I'm going to do. It's going to lead to this. It's easily obtained. I'm going to go forward to this. Don't spend too much time making all these different systems. That will come later. And I have a quote I always say, which is this. Every complex system starts out, I actually have a screen here. Every complex system starts out as a simple system that works and then evolves. Don't let complexity scare you off. Not every app or game needs the interconnected loop system or free to play strategy game. So basically what I mean with this, one thing at a time, uh, build your narrative, build your social fabric, Build your achievements or your uh, progression system, your persistence system, build that. And in the end, who is this person after it's gone through the entire wish wash of things I've been talking about? Also have a solid core loop. So that's how we usually work in the AAA game development. I can't say too much about it because there's a lot of secrecy and it's like, a, it's like the Da Vinci code. It's difficult to decipher. Um, but that's pretty much it. I mean, that's how we usually um, work on our games. That's how we bring them forward. And that's, that's the mentality we have when we are in the studio, we're working. Every day we ask ourselves the same questions. Every day we keep redesigning things. Um, it's not uncommon that four months into development, you come up with a new system and it's like, wow, we have to change everything. 
So uh, these kinds of things happen all the time. Uh, but again, like I said, focus on what's basic in your game. If you want your character to jump, try it 10 times. If you want it to jump over a cliff, try it 10 times. If you put up a wall there, why are you putting up a wall? Always ask yourself the same questions. Why are we doing this? What's in the return for this person? Don't spend too much time on assets that you don't need. I sound like a grandpa now, but seriously, don't do that. Don't spend money on things you don't need in the games. If you want to, like, if you want to go for really good graphical fidelity, like for Battlefield, for instance, uh, we decided for Battlefield 4 that we we're going to upgrade Frostbite, the engine we had for Battlefield 3, the amazing engine we built, and uh, because more EA studios were about to use this, so I wanted to upgrade this, make it easier for all the EA studios to use, and. Um, we, we had a very strict deadline on the schedule. So we didn't mess around with too many fancy things. So we worked on shaders, worked on ray casting, we worked on all these different things that actually matter to people. You will actually see them instead of going behind the engine. And um, every engine has its complications, but I think we overcame that perfectly. We hid buffers behind and whatnot. So yeah, so that's pretty much it. So if you have any questions, I don't know. Do you have questions now? You probably have a lot of questions. So let me put this thing on. Can we get the first question? Okay, can we do the guy in the black shirt first? Uh, I can speak. Eu posso falar inglês. Is it English? Yeah. yeah. We have to turn the mic on. Hello, 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 hello. Uh, my question is about matchmaking. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't, I'm not a, a really a multiplayer gamer myself, myself but uh, I, I do own Battlefield 3. And it's really frustrating to, to get into the game. And I mean, I, I don't suck, but I'm not very good at it either. So it's very <coughs> bad when you get into a game and there's a bunch of people that can like snipe you like from a mile away with no difficulty at all. Uh, my question is, is just telemetry is good for matchmaking or do you guys do something else? Or so this is, this is the blindness of stats. That's why you need to play test gear games all the time. This is the blindness of stats. So we look at the back end and we see a lot of people are getting snipe kills uh, in this part of the map. A lot of people are dying in this part of the map. Uh, we have heat maps to see this as well. Um, but it doesn't mean that people got sniped. Because it won't tell us that the person that died there died from a sniper shot from this and this weapon from there. It just tells us people shoot a lot here, they die a lot there. It doesn't tell us anything else. So we have to draw our own conclusions. So basically, stat is blind. It's not telling us anything that you're telling us. So we have to experience that ourselves. Um, I think that's, that just goes into <laughs> like bad judgment or something. That just goes into you have to play your game more. You have to realize what you're actually putting out and basically look at stats again and try to develop more accurate stats for this. That's pretty much what I could say. Do we have a, yeah, the guy in the black shirt over there? Uh, about your core loop. Um, your example, uh, applica uh, uh, game in mobile, okay? Uh, but uh, the core loop using in PC gaming, console gaming, uh, or only a uh, game in mobile? Uh, if, I, if I play mobile games and console games or? Yeah. I play everything actually. I, ha I have to, because I have to see what everyone's doing, study what everyone's doing. Um, I used to be a PC person, and then I lost my PC because my cat spilled tea in it. Sounds amazing. Um, but yeah, so I lost my PC and I only play on console. And I just moved to Dubai, so I don't have a PC. So I have to buy one later. Um, are there any questions anyone has about narrative, persistent system, or is there, does everyone know exactly what to do now? So can we get this? Yeah, I got. Yeah, go ahead. Whoa, whoa. Yeah. Hello. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I like to say, uh, not about the negative. It's about getting started. Uh, well, you say you get a, a straight line, uh, you gotta say what you play, what was playing, for you build another game or something like that. 
when your first game, you're going, wh what you're going to do, you launch your first game, or not in a company or something like that. What advice you can mm. tell us? So I think, first of all, you need to have an idea of what you want to do. That's the most important thing. They have to believe in that idea. But you have to be your worst critic. You have to tell yourself that the idea is bad and why it could be better all the time. Um, I'd say start drawing up the idea, put it down on paper, and um, try to sell it to someone. That's what we did. So how we worked at Dice basically is uh, I was a producer. I had an idea. I wrote it down on a piece of paper. I gave it to my creative director. And four or five designers were in the same room. And these four or five designers say, why do you choose this? Why is this like that? Why is this like this? What does this happen after this? Do you expect it to be like so? Just questioning you all the time. So you have to defend your idea because you have to believe in it. If you don't believe in it, it's just bullshit. No one's gonna, no one's gonna use it. So, uh, so my advice is build an idea, believe in it. Um, I don't know if you're a designer or a coder, but start working on it and um, pick an angle. In my opinion, like I said, you can't do everything. You can't build a really strong story and have a good social layer. Let's say you, well, you can't build a story where it's going to be immersive like The Last of Us, where you have people pick your options in the game via social, uh, and they get rewards for it. And it's really cool. You can't really do that. I mean, you can if you have a lot of money, and if you have three years of dev time, sure, that works. Um, but if you want to scale it down and make it minimum, sure, that's fine. You can definitely do that. But pick one. That's my option. I mean, we tried to do everything with uh, Battlefield 4 and contextually, it was a really good game. Content-wise, solid game. Performance, really bad. So, um, so that's kind of the lesson we learned from, from going from there to now. Hi. Hello. Hello. Uh, I have two Two questions here. Oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yes, uh, it's about. I don't remember when it was, but I I saw a Titanfall gameplay. I found it interesting, and I and I give a try to it. But when I bought the game, I saw that it was just a multiplayer game. It was my fault. <laughs> I should have <laughs> researched it first. But then I saw that Battlefield, it's just multiplayer too. It's kind of a trend. You know, uh, Mark, you know, uh, your portfolio is yeah. like uh, a lot of EA games, and both of these two were from EA. It's uh, Battlefield. Will have will have a story, or will be just multiplayer? Yeah, yeah. I mean, <coughs> we focused on. I mean, a lot of games. We used to say, when was this? 2011. Almost 2000. Five years ago. Five years ago, we used to say, if you don't have three components in your game, it's not a AAA game. So you had to have co-op, you had to have, <coughs> sorry, you had to have co-op, multiplayer, and single player. Uh, three years ago, no, sorry, this was five years ago. But you had to have this. Otherwise, everyone would say your game is shit. You're not going to rate 80+. plus. Uh, Metacritic is very important, so you can't rate 80+. plus. Um, you can't basically uh, sell your game at a, as a package. Uh, but I think further down the line now, people have realized that that doesn't really matter. Less is actually more. You don't have to cram in co-op, multiplayer, single player in a one and a half year dev cycle because that's impossible. That's just not gonna happen. If you have a really strong team, then yeah, maybe. If you have enough people, <coughs> outsource a bunch of stuff, maybe you can pull it off, but logically shouldn't even be able to. Um, but these days, more games go towards like one concept, Battlefront, multiplayer, um, Titanfall, multiplayer, for instance, they focus on what they do best, and they release it. <coughs> COD somehow managed to do single player and multiplayer. They make it really well, so. Uh, another question is, when you, when, so, uh, when you talk about not, complete, not completing a game, for example, there is some kind of proportion of the length of the game. For example, I am playing Fallout 4, and I don't have time to finish the game. It's too long. There's, a, there's a, you think about it when you will build the game, yeah. the game if you'll be yeah. too I mean, late. So Fallout 4 is a perfect example of really good writers on your team. Amazing writers. Um, every side quest in Fallout 4 kind of feels like a mission. It kind of could feel like, the main, like a smaller main quest. 
So basically, they've invested a lot of money in good writers. They probably have a team of 15, 20 people just writing and designing these different quests. And they thought about that because it's a huge game. Take The Witcher, for example. Kind of the same thing, where there are some of the side quests can lead to bigger stories. Um, so it's kind of the same focus as there. So writers are really big in the industry now, like writer, designers, that kind of stuff. Um, so if you're thinking about a career in games and you love writing, perfect. That's your new career. It's amazing. Does anyone have more questions? Go. Cool. Um, uh, I'm an avid Battlefield player, and I, you were a, you were a community manager. I remember seeing you on Reddit, and I stalked your battle log profile to get the the dice tag. And um, I want to know your opinion, not as a dice employee, but as a game dev on mod tools and um, what challenges um, does releasing mod tools for a triple A game does a company have to think about what problems can it have for um, releasing releasing mods for a game that, it, that has such a magnitude such as Battlefield? Over, overall security, uh, I think that's the most important question. I mean mod tools involve releasing server files uh, because Frostbite is server based. If you release server files out to the public then anything can happen. Right? Um, game can easily be hacked. Uh, service can be compromised. Backing can be compromised. So what we do is we just, so at that time, we just didn't want to release it. As well as there was a good content plan as well from DICE going forward, so, or EA going forward. So I think mod tools are good stuff. I used to mod back in the days on Battlefield 2 and Half-Life, but I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's good to, um, what did I say? Again, mod tools. Um, sorry, I lost my track. I've got five minutes left, that's why. Thank you. Um, no, so what I was saying, mod tools, really good stuff, really powerful stuff, makes you creative, but then in the end, it all comes down to the studio owning the license for the engine. That's just um, how it is. If you want to work on something amazing, then apply to DICE, I guess. I'm sorry, I mean, that's, that's just what they chose at that time because of legal liabilities and everything as well. So, Okay, I had five minutes left, so I'm just going to say thank you so much for coming out. Uh, I hope you took away a little bit at least from this lecture. That was a bit chaotic. I think I have a fever too, so I'm really sorry if I talk too much. Um, thank you for coming out, by the way, and I'll see you around campus party. I'm going to be at Campus B drinking beer tonight, so I'll catch you there. See you guys. Thank you so much.